Hi, and welcome back to Food Farms and Chefs. And I am super excited to introduce to you Robert Wallachin, who is the own one of the owners, actually, of <laughs> Manny's Deli, uh, which now has two locations. So welcome to Food Farms and Chefs. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> so <clears throat> you co-own this with two of your friends, um, but there's a little bit of a story and background that goes in there. But before we delve into that, let our listeners know who you are, how you got started in this business, where you went to school, you know. Sure. Yeah. So Rob Wallace and I, uh, I grew up kind of in a Montgomery County area, um, went to school for hospitality, restaurants, hotels. I kind of, I was in hotels. I've been in animal rescue management. So I've been a little bit everywhere, bounced around. And then um, kind of the, the way, the reason I got back into Delhi specifically was um, kind of, you know, I was working at a hotel, Jeremy, one of my partners, he, uh, we've always kind of floated around an idea of doing something with each other. And, but he was always in Florida. He moved back. He said, let's talk. And, um, you know, we, we just started talking and, and he had told me that his dad's old deli, which is what we took over, was he had heard rumblings that they were looking to sell it. And would I be interested in it? Um, delis wasn't my, my, my first choice to be to be honest it wasn't like ooh delis but um as as we started talking more about it we we thought that it's kind of this restaurant and and cuisine that hasn't really been given the 21st century touch i would say <laughs> um and so we you know we we uh we said okay it's a it's a good idea and we kind of um you know we took over um an, a deli that was existing that kind of had had it had a tay day and kind of was on its way down. His dad had sold it years ago and it kind of changed hands a couple of times. And, um, you know, we, we took over that about six years ago and, and just kind of started making our, our little touches to, you know, online ordering, cleaning it up. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of people I talk to ask about what, like, <laughs> what why Jewish delis and and everything I have ever heard of them is they're grumpy who work there. You're scared to ask for you know how you want your meat cut, and we wanted to do it the opposite way. You know, bring in the hospitality aspect that we thought Jewish delis were were kind of missing. I I worked at Kimpton Hotels. Jeremy's a a Disney guy. Ran, ran you know restaurants at Disney, so that's kind of how the whole thing developed. I would say. I mean, and given that both of you, you know, and obviously there's a third partner as well. Um, but two of you, you know, have some history in the hospitality business. So, and a well-established um, hospitality industry. So Kimpton, obviously they have, you know, everything kind of like set regimented, like there's a, a, a you know, way that you go about doing things <laughs> and Disney's the same way. Totally. Probably tenfold. Um, <laughs> but we won't we won't upset Disney at all by like delving into anything. They're listening. Like so. Yeah, they're always listening. They are always listening. <laughs> um, but like obviously you said this isn't delis were not your your first go to. What would what would your first go to have been? So, I mean, we, we talked about a lot about like like at the time, gastro pubs were pretty were pretty like popular and trendy like you know all the micro beers that were you know that are now you see at every bar every everywhere they weren't they were kind of like just getting popular and mm -hmm. so we we did talk about like something like that kind of like a local type of a bar with like a good beer program and and kind of like an interesting unique food menu yeah um kind of that that kind of went off you know i oh, and yeah. As somebody who worked in bars, it wasn't exactly my, as I worked more and more in bars, I didn't feel like dealing with the clientele of two o'clock in the morning drunk people. Yeah. And I mean, delis, delis, you kind of like, you get, you draw a particular crowd because obviously the crowd, anybody who's a, a frequenter of a Jewish deli, of course, 
it, they know like the portion sizes are usually gigantic. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been into a Jewish deli without like being like, and I know there's going to be most of that leftover that I'm going to take home and enjoy this again and again. Um, but We're definitely not skimpy. Yeah. Uh, and I, and, and, I want I want to ask because you're you're obviously saying that you wanted to update the the experience um, it, as a general rule of thumb for your place. So what else have you done in order to to kind of bring it into the 21st century or I think? Tw yeah, we're still in the 21st. Century. Yeah, we are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Where am I? Who knows? I don't um, know. Yeah. So I, so like our, our first spot. Um, which is in Holland, that's that's definitely still a little bit more traditional. Uh, you know, like full service has like the dinery type menu where you can get a little bit of everything on the menu. Um, but but at the same time, you know, introducing a, a new point of sale system, um, you know, especially at our at our new spot and, and at the other stuff, like online ordering, our our online ordering platform. Um, which is through Toast, um, which is our point of sale system. But we, it's, it's, it's on point. So if you want to go and order a pound of corned beef and not go sit at a deli and wait twenty minutes for them to call your ticket and finally get to your to to you and cut your corned beef, you can order that all in advance, have it ready for you. And that's not something that a lot of delis are doing right now. Um, yeah. And I think it's, a, especially in this area, it's a, it's a competitive advantage. People are on their way home from work. We want to get a quick, you know, quick, quick thing, order it when you leave, pick it up and, and you're in and out in, in a minute instead of, let me stop, let me talk, talk for like 10 minutes. And then I'm in there for a half hour. <laughs> um, we still have that because, you know, our customer service, the hospitality aspect is still very important to us. Yeah. But I also understand time constraints are, are crucial nowadays as somebody with two kids. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's an area where we've definitely gone a little bit um, above most of the other delis. And then just like our menu, like having unique items, like we have, we have a sandwich called the Jubano. It's like a blend of a Cuban and a, and, you know, with roast, uh, you know, with corned beef and pastrami instead of, you know, the traditional thing and just trying like little plays on things that we're doing. And, and that's all obviously growing, but just, you know, Delhi has a has this like only a certain group of people eat it. And I think it's not necessarily the, very true. It's like it's a food that ev appeals to everybody. Chicken salad appeals to everybody. Tuna salad. You know, it's it's a universal food. And I think trying to show people that it's not you don't have to be Jewish to come into a Jewish deli. It's it's you know, the food is everybody likes the food and it's you know, it's it's a good everyday food, not just, you know, for somebody to go on a Sunday to get their locks. Yeah. And, and I have to, I have to say the first introduction that I had to, and I'm not sure which of you, um, I had met and I may have actually met more than one of you. It's been, it's been some years, um, uh, but it was when you guys first opened, uh, and in, keeping on point with uh, staying on trend, you you guys were one of the vendors at an influencer party. Um, and I just, I remember I was dolled up and I was taking photos and one of you ran up and you were like, oh, we just opened up our deli. Can you take pictures? Can he hand you a bag? Because I know he had a bunch of bags that night too. Yeah, yeah, he I did. I you. actually still have the bag. I actually Great almost bag. brought the bag with me. It is an, uh, an awesome bag. Um, you know, because it keeps things cold and it's huge. <laughs> yeah, that was my partner, Chase. But yeah, like, again, just keeping with the, we're not, you know, it, we're, we're, you know, the three of us are three young guys who happen to own a Jewish deli. And, and I think, you know, part of that is like, we have a lot of fun, fun with it. Like, we're, we're, we're still going out, you know, yeah. he's, he's, he lives in the city. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're on social media, we're, you know, it's, you know, we're still growing that part of it. But again, just embracing these trends that I don't think everybody in this industry, or at least the Jewish deli industry is necessarily on social media, you know, doing like tug of war contests, like with their staff in the middle of the summer, because why not, you know, yeah. I think, you know, coming up with like, you know, fun, 
witty off the cuff content, you know, cause that's, that's kind of what we're trying to, to, you know, to do while, you know, good food while having a lot of fun. Yeah. And it, and it's fun for, you know, your social media presence too. And it gets your name out there and what you guys are offering and, you know, the thing that distinguishes you guys above the rest. So, and, and I'm glad that you actually brought up the Ju Jubano because when I look, when I was looking over your menu, I was like, that's really cute. And the fact that you have Reuben fries, I was like, Oh, I need to come in there and have the Reuben fries. Like how, how have I not? Exactly. With whiz. <laughs> like how what's not enjoyable about that? Like French fries on its own, on their own, I should say, are like obviously something that would draw somebody in, but then you're like adding in like the 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 meat, the cheese, and it's just sure. yeah, delight. <laughs> and that's and that's like kind of the things that like so that's that's an item that's uh, available at like our, our primary location. But the like, but not available at the new Manny's Deli Stop. And one of the things that I'm hoping for at Deli Stop is we we tighten the menu pretty significantly. It's like our fast casual concept of mm. of the traditional Jewish deli. It's more it's more like you know replicable and and a little bit more like has a little bit more black and white, whereas the other one has a lot of gray area. And and the goal is really like it's a concept that I think we could grow. Yeah. Um, but also something like with a tighter menu, we can do fun stuff like Reuben fries, a special, or, you yeah. know, like throw these different specials, which are coming in the pipeline that we're going to have a lot of unique items monthly, weekly at the, at the new place. Um, and we have lakas at the new place, which are amazing, which I want people to try They're You know, everybody comes in, I want fries. It's like, Try these lakas. If you don't like them, let me know, and we'll we'll talk about bringing in fries. And most people come back and are like, "Okay, I I got you. Those those were those were delicious." Now, do you do do you present them with the traditional sour cream and um the uh, applesauce? Yeah, they they have a choice of that, but that's a good idea. Like coming up with you know like a unique dipping sauce for for them that you know. That's you I mean, just gave me ideas. Thank you. It, I was gonna say it is tis the season for Halloween and and pumpkin spice. So, Ooh. Pumpkin, right? Just saying. I think of, yeah. I mean, I I'm I swear I should be paid for being a consultant because at least one like one one segment every guest gets some sort of like idea from me. <laughs> like like a light bulb going off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, and and they're so good too. Like as, as soon as you said that, I was like, well, now I want to go there and try it and post it on social media. <laughs> and I would like for you to do that also. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we both know somebody who can definitely make that connection and true, <laughs> really true, push you to true, like fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um like how exciting is it for you guys to have this other location because you 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 know in in essence like just opened it. Yeah. Two and a half, two and a half months. Yeah. Um it's really exciting because you know the other the other location obviously really exciting because we we were able to take over, you know, an existing spot and and bring it back to like their family, you know. But this is our baby in the sense that we saw it from permit stage to build out to, you know, the, and, and the concept, you know, everything is, is, is ours. So it's, uh, it's exciting to be able to, to get to, to the fact that we got there um, because it's, you know, it's kind of what we've been wanting to, to get to for, for a long time. And it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely cool to see because, you know, we designed it, we came up with the menu and, and it's you know, not like we did it, do a lot on the other spot, but it was open and we just kind of cleaned it up. Whereas this was built from, from, you know, ground up. Yeah. Now, do you guys have like a set seating or is this more of a, you know, like literal grab and go, like order what you want, sit down for a, a hot second and then go. And um, so we do have, we have like a counter where we have about eight seats and then we have um, eight, take like eight seats at, for um, table seats like low tops and then a couple tables outside so we do have some seating it is all counter service um so you order and then if you're sitting here we'll bring the food out to you um but it is but it is mostly you know 
in the plan, it was mostly designed as a as a takeout, um, you know, establishment. Yeah. Now, do you have takeout like matzo ball soup and and you know chicken noodle? Like you guys, I I don't I don't know one deli that doesn't have like that gigantic ball of matzo. <laughs> I mean, and it's so it's comfort food. It is. I mean, it's it's it is. It's uh, Jewish penicillin. They they say, but it it, it is uh. Yeah, we have all of that stuff. Um, we have cold soup in the fridge to go if you don't, you know, if you want to just come in and grab. You can. We have the hot soup, obviously, always on on uh, in the pots. Um, right now, we're just doing the chicken noodle and matzo ball. But as the the weather kind of cools cools down, we're going to start adding a lot of the soups that we have at the other place. You know, cabbage borscht, uh, mushroom barley, the split pea, and mm. obviously some 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 special ones as well that we'll do. You know more frequently than we do now. Yeah. I I had a, a chef on a self-taught, I think she was a self-taught chef, but she actually took comfort meals and turned them into like soups and stews. Um, so I'm like, maybe you could, you know, like one of your specials could be something like. Interesting. Yeah. That's like chicken pot pie soup is delicious if you've ever had that. Yeah, it's so, absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's scrumptious yeah. and very, very filling. Yeah. <laughs> Not, I mean, people love soup like people are always looking for unique soup so we try to you know at, like in the winter at our other uh at our main spot like we're always doing rotations of of soups and keeping it fresh yeah in your original spot you also have skillets and, and whatnot too i don't think i've ever seen a jewish deli that had a like a skillet meal yeah corned beef skillet delicious um, but yeah, I you know a lot of the stuff that's on that menu is stuff that we just like eating at other places that we're like, this would be delicious. Let's put this on the menu. And, and, you know, most, most of the time it hits and, you know, some of the times where our, our eating habits are a little unique. <laughs> well, it's, it, you know what, it's funny. Cause in, I wanted to get into the, like your story, like the, the reason why the three of you actually, uh, establish this business but we only have uh, about a minute or so left um with you so do you have anything coming up like any kind of big celebrations um or anything well, the high holidays are here so um rosh hashanah is this week getting ready for that and then uh yom kippur uh on the 25th so that's that's eating up most of our more month uh is is preparing for that and then you know really just especially with the new place, just getting everything, you know, set as people kind of make their way back from the shore and getting ready for, you know, I think a little bit of an increase in, in sales and um, establishing our catering. Um, that's, you know, a big bread and butter, you know, for all the local businesses that are kind of coming back from, from summer, just kind of introducing ourselves and, you know, just kind of making our mark there as well. Which is, you know, part of what you're you're on here for so i i love that you joined us on food farms and chefs and i me. hope that you're able to celebrate all of the holidays <laughs> coming up and um let our listeners know where to find you online and in person sure so uh in person you can go to um it's 4003 welsh road willow grove pa 19090. That's Manny's Deli Stop. Then our original location is uh, 102 Buck Road. And that's Southampton, Holland area, depending on who you ask. Um, and that's 18966. And then um, online, delimannies.com or uh, manniesdelistop.com takes you both to our website and uh, all of our information, holiday menus, catering menus, online ordering, everything is, is right there. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on Food Farms and Chefs. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. No problem. And we will be right back after this short break. Hi, and welcome back to Food Farms and Chefs. And I am excited to introduce all of our listeners to Chef Elizabeth Faulkner. Chef, welcome to Food Farms and Chefs. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy that you joined us um, and, and made time out of your busy, busy schedule. Uh, so prior to actually hopping on, we had a little bit of a powwow. Um, but I know one of the big things that I want to kind of focus on is your new docu documentary that's, you know, out. <clears throat> sorry, we're not. Yeah, or sorry, we're closed. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. Really happy about this film. Um, it just uh, got released out there on uh, Apple TV, iTunes, Amazon Prime, Vudu, and Google Play um, just uh, about a month ago. So it's out and about and people are watching it and it's, it's fun because it's been a long project to get, it seems so long to get it out. It's almost like I've said making a independent documentary film is very much especially during COVID is very yeah. much like opening a restaurant so um, really happy the film's out because it's a bunch of really great conversations I had with chefs around the country that we shot during 2020 yeah and and it's it's funny because you're documenting that like on television for a wide audience to visually see the you know what's been going on and the, the behind scenes um, back of house if you will <laughs> <laughs> of what's going on um mm -hmm. and i obviously our show we center on restaurateurs on chefs and you know i've heard and i have personal you know rapports and relationships with chefs that are you know local startups you know whatnot and i've i've seen and heard all of the the aftermath basically of what the pandemic did and you know it's i I get, have to give you accolades for bringing or bringing another light to it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think what's really, there's a few things that are so interesting to me about this film. Um, one, you know, when the the pandemic hit and we were all sort of like, you know, thinking, oh, this might last a couple of weeks. And then, uh, you know, we, just, we kind of, then everybody had to stay at home and then, um, and then, Black Lives Matter erupted on the streets and there was just so much stuff going on kind of like on a daily basis for several months there. And then we still were dealing with, you know, people were dying from um, COVID and, and we had uh, kind of chaotic political times. And uh, it just, I, I think it was so challenging for all these chef friends of mine to try to figure out what to do and it's already, I think what the film exposed was that it's already before all this happened was already a very fragile system. The restaurant industry, independent restaurant industry is a very fragile kind of business model. And um, so I, you know, and I was genuinely very concerned for everybody who was in the bit in, in the business and what in the world would they be doing? And so I went and talked to a bunch of people, but of course, like making a film in the middle of that was equally as challenging because here we are talking to some great chefs around the country, a lot of voices that I wanted people to hear um, from different kinds of restaurants, not all celebrity chefs or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we couldn't shoot their film. We couldn't shoot their food. Um, we had to go back and do B-roll the next year when we, when it was like safer because we couldn't actually go into their restaurants. So try making a food film when you can't shoot people's food and everybody's wearing a mask i mean it's pretty challenging uh, i would definitely have then, to agree with you know, that I think, <laughs> I think we just learned so much about how um you know really like heroic and diehard these people are um that just kind of put themselves second to taking care of other people and i think that's you know, this becomes like a love letter to the restaurant business because I've owned and operated restaurants before. And, and here I could see all these people really trying all of the creative ways to deal with, you know, how to get food to people in a, in a wild time. And then, you know, we've, I think we're like, without giving too much away, but we have some great people in the film who it becomes almost prophetic at some point because, you know, we start talking about, you know, tipping and things that are currently sort of issues in the industry. Yeah. And, and all this stuff comes up in our dialogue. And, and I think what it teaches people, if you're not in the restaurant business is, wow, I didn't know that it was so challenging for all these people because they just, we thought people just like to cook, you know? And <laughs> um, I think we learned a lot more about the restaurant industry through the process of this filmmaking film, making this film. Which is, I mean, I feel like because for the average Joe, and I, I probably know more than most people. I've, as I said, I've, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while, and I have friends who are chefs, so I, I get to to see some of the ins and outs 
of of what's going on but it is it's difficult and you guys are on your feet for like 16 to 20 hours sometimes you spend more time actually most times all of you spend more time in the kitchen than you do in your personal lives only because your you know your heart and soul is in it um and it just requires that much yeah yeah and then you know as far as the the pandemic is concerned it also like created that that influx of of the inf uh, inflation and you are you know in a position where the the cost in order to produce these menu items the the um what you guys receive back is so marginalized like after all the costs are put out for you know to all your pur purveyors to your employees to you know and whatnot so I, I'm sure, you know, the difficulties of having to face that as well is included in that too. Yeah, and I think what we've learned after this, you know, chunk of time now is that, I mean, people, our consumer has really um, adopted, uh, the restaurants and the consumer have really adopted a lot of what, what happened in that time, which is people order food delivery much more now than they ever did. Um, in the film, we have some people that never did to-go business who developed a to-go business or developed a whole other business because of some of their to-go items, or they continue to sell, you know, grocery items basically because it was necessary during the pandemic. But now it's like, oh, people got used to buying, you know, pasta from that place. And now they just do more of that kind of, um, commerce. Um, and I think, you know, like some of the things we talk about in the film is that in the future, there will be uh, more pop-ups and collaborations. And I got that. And so people, you know, I'm it. the movie does focus on, on a lot of intense um, subjects, in, you know, in the, in the, um, the tough times of the restaurant business. But it also is, I think, um, inspirational because you already are seeing people that have reprioritized how they're going to do their operations, how, you know, it made them think a little bit. It made us all think, and not just the restaurant business, but it made everybody kind of stop and go, wait a minute, do, should we do the same business or should we kind of change this a little bit? And I think that's a positive. And I think we're seeing, we will see, continue to see the creativity of um, humans and chef people come up with more and more clever ways to um, make better food decisions and get food, you know, and get food to people that's fun and dynamic and an experience and you know all those good things the storytelling yeah. yeah and i'm glad that you said that because that kind of gives me a window to pull into the fact that um the foods that you produce that the your instagram feed for in particular everything's very healthy and i know that you're very healthy and you lead a very healthy active lifestyle um and you're involved well in i try <laughs> <laughs> but i mean that's my it's my Instagram world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I know that you've also like you you do have a cookbook that's out. I want to plug that too. Um, but that's desserts, so <laughs> maybe not not on the well, I have you know, I have more than one cookbook actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it it's been a little, little while that it's a, that I've done a cookbook because I feel like now we just use social media so much more and you know, there and then I'm much I'm I'm very excited about filmmaking and television and stuff so I'm just trying to do more and more of that and yeah try to you know because I do I believe people should I mean I I really I'm I'm somebody who's really wanted my chef community to stay healthy um just I mean I just want people to be healthy I want people to make smart food decisions and it doesn't mean that I don't I I love indulgent things too but I'm not somebody who likes a lot of manufactured or um refined processes in food because i i really do believe that i mean i just love going to the farmer's market i'm mm -hmm. i mean it comes out i mean i have to go to the farmer's market in the film i love go, i mean i just my instagram feed since i moved back to california and go to santa monica or studio city farmer's market often i'm just always like in, you know, i'm just infatuated with the produce and i can't believe how delicious and yummy everything is so i just want people i just want to spread that message or that passion I have for what's seasonal and exciting and and then try to stay fit and that makes me make better food decisions when I cook for other people too yeah and um and I do know that you've you've taught um some classes you've taught classes in the past as well um on on how to cook and 
and you know to incorporate that to a lifestyle like I, sorry i'm jumping around there i have a chef no no friend. it's okay <laughs> i have a chef friend who said i don't even know if it was on the radio or if it was a private conversation at this point <laughs> but um they they had stated that they were teaching kids like as a you know uh just an outlier kind of class and the kids were like wait tomatoes don't come in a can <laughs> they you know they grow from a plant oh i know and it's so sad <laughs> but like you know there are well, it... sorry you go <laughs> no sorry um i was gonna just say i i know it's really that is really um something i think we've had to deal with for I, I think our, you know, our country, the world gets obsessed with different, you know, technological advances in, in canning and preserving and making sauces and putting condiments and food stuff out there. And it's kind of a fun thing of what we do. I mean, who doesn't like a really good, you know, um, well, I, you know, I was just thinking of like preserves, like I love getting like, you know, I, I remember recently I just bought like a jar of fancy burgundy cassis jam from a, you know, high end grocery store. And I was just like, I, I can't really buy black currants in where I live. So yeah. like having a jar of black currant jelly is very exciting and delicious to me. So I think that that's, and it's fun. I've worked in a lot of, um, with a lot of brands and a lot of food development for, you know, industrial lines to make different flavor profiles like let's just say of like some of the different pa power bars out there or different beverage companies and that stuff is all fascinating and interesting and fun to play in and it's mm -hmm. fun to see like make you know something come to life and put it into big manufacturing but the truth is I don't really want to eat you know like that all the time I want what's good and fresh and I think that we've had a couple of uh, quite a few decades of people growing up in places where they don't really grow the emphasis in the culture has not been to grow seasonal produce which by the way you don't have to live in california to grow seasonal produce you can grow it anywhere yeah and um you know it's something that we've historically always done as human beings until like the last couple hundred years when we really started changing a lot of you know this concept of a supermarket is relatively new right so yeah um, I'd like for us to get back to like, hey, this is where carrots and green beans and beets and all those things come from. They don't really come from a can, you know? Yeah. And I have to say, like, we try to encourage our, our listeners to to go to CSAs and to go to farmers markets and just kind of get out there and like even just search online to see what's out there and available because, it you know, fresh is best. And across the board, mm -hmm. everyone, you know, every chef would would agree fresh is best <laughs> it just brings a strong right. yeah a stronger profile to everything that you're creating it's going to have a you know you can balance it better it, it'll bloom better in in whatever you're creating um you know so it's it it's to your benefit to go out and and find those things plus it's at your full like capacity of like your nutrients you know the greener that that right. is. yeah so <laughs> i feel like i'm preaching to somebody who, who clearly you already know all this <laughs> but um well you know, i love all that but not everybody knows all that you know and it, i think people like um i i was just talking to somebody the other day that about how there was a huge boom at the beginning of 2020 when we heard about the pandemic uh, in the sale of seeds it was like a record year of people bought seeds to plant their own vegetables and fruits and everything yeah. so um that's pretty exciting news to me about what happened in a kind of crazy time <laughs> um and i i don't know if everybody's still harvesting and replanting and thinking about their soil but i think it's I think that was a moment where we could say, oh, wow, people did go. I mean, even in New York, I was living in New York when that all happened. And I, one of my chef friends who's in the film, Gabrielle Hamilton, pointed out to me that a bunch of um, people had planted vegetables on the side of FDR Drive. Oh, wow. and, and I was like, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's so New York. It's so great because people are like, well, you got to find whatever parcel of land 
to plant some stuff in because, you know, people, we didn't know, like, where were we going to, how was the food supply going to get to us, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it's pretty, yeah, I think, and it's so fun to grow stuff. I love being around kids when they um, plant, you know, vegetables and then can see how they grow and then pull them out of the ground and cook with them. It's, and I, it's so important to get kids to eat eat like that because if you have that experience young you're going to carry it with you for your whole life and say that's what it's supposed to taste like yeah no I'm I, that almost makes me wonder you know do you have any other documentaries that in in the works and because that almost sounds like a, a an appropriate documentary that would be cool um I certainly am having several conversations about uh television and documentary stuff and so I I have a couple of ideas of of things I'd like to to work on but uh you know it's funny like the way that that film came together Pete the director and I had met before we ever heard of the pandemic about talk about doing a film on uh, sort of the state of mind or mental health of chefs and then when that all happened it was like oh my gosh this is like the right time to go to talk to these people this is a it's a perfect storm you know and yeah. And it was probably such a unique moment to to be able to round up all of those chefs. So like I, you know, reached out to people in first in Los Angeles and then in uh, Northern California and then, you know, in New York and New Jersey. And it was like, I feel like I was so lucky to get their attention in this very short time frame of what we had to shoot. But that was probably that I know that was because they didn't have as much to do. Yeah, be you know, because they were <laughs> all you know, staying at home or barely going to their restaurant and trying to figure out how to navigate that. So, um, I think sometimes that's the thing about filmmaking, like or especially documentary filmmaking, you want to sort of plan as much as you can, but then sometimes life just happens and you kind of go, "Oh my God, this is the moment to talk about that." Um, and I, and I like that about you know, art and filmmaking. And I like it when you're kind of working on a few different things and then suddenly go, oh, that pot's ready and I've got to serve that food right now. So that's how I look at it. Like I might have a few projects that I'd like to do and how I get to them will be, depend on, you know, timing. Yes. Um, now in the last few moments that we have with you, because time flies when you're having fun, um, is there <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that you would like to plug or, you know, let our listeners know where to find you online? Well, um, so I, you know, lately I, uh, I live in, I'm based in Los Angeles. I still cook at lots of different events and, um, and I cook for Rosie O'Donnell for, uh, for my regular job. And it, she's great. She's a wonderful person. I love cooking for her and her family and friends that come over and, um, and then I also, you know, I have all these several different projects in the works. I'm working on a new food and beverage company that'll launch next year. I can't really talk about that, but I would still like to say, everybody, please go see the film. It's really easy to um, get it on Apple TV or or uh, Amazon or wherever you. Um, it's it's. I feel like it's all over the place. It's really easy. It comes stream up. It's, and, it's called yeah. Sorry We're Closed. Yeah, <laughs> and um, just really grateful for all the chefs I got to speak with during that time who. Um, I think the film is really unique because I'm not a journalist that way. I'm another chef and I'm having chef to chef conversations. And so they really open up quite easily with me. And I think that also makes the film pretty unique. It it, it will. And uh, I look forward to watching it at home as well. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us on Food Farms and Chefs, Elizabeth. Oh, my God. I so appreciate it. Love it. <laughs> All right. And uh, hopefully when you launch the product reach out to us and we'll bring you back on. That sounds great. <laughs> okay. I'll be able to talk about it soon. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And uh, on that note, we will be right back after this short break. Hi, and welcome back to Food Farms and Chefs. And I'm excited to introduce you to a new Raishian who is one of the event organizers for UpcomingEvents.com. Ray, thank you for joining us on Food Farms and Chefs. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast and your radio stations. Really looking forward to today's conversation. I know. And you guys have a lot going on over there at upcoming events. But let our listeners know, you know, who you are a little bit, a little bit about your background and, you know, 
what what it is that you do. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So who doesn't love craft beer, wine, cocktails, and food? I mean, that's really, uh, we have just the perfect space. We're in the perfect vertical. And we love bringing people together and letting people really get intimate with things that they've maybe never tried before, never tasted before. And that's really our, our main objective and really our mission. So, And think about it. And a lot of your listeners, they, they can they can relate to this. You'll go to maybe a restaurant or maybe you go to your local state store or package store and you see like a, a wine or a new sort of drink or a cocktail. And you're just, you don't necessarily feel like spending 30 or $40 on a bottle of wine that you've never tried before. And the beautiful thing about our events is you can actually come out and sample all these amazing products. And you're going to probably find something that you don't particularly like. But what you are going to do, you're going to find something that you absolutely love. So that's what we do. We're in the the business of bringing people together, showing them in good time and while getting them real intimate with certain brands that maybe they've never tried before. Yeah. And I mean, that is one a key thing to like mention because, you you know, like and sometimes actually like just friends who like give you a bottle of wine, you're like, you have I don't like wasting wine. Yeah. I mean, why not? Um, <laughs> but but uh, like it's it's always an appropriate situation where you can go there and you can try a bunch of and a plethora of wines and cocktails and foods um, that that are available just to go around and taste. But how long? Like if if I were to buy a ticket, how long you know of of does the event run for? Yeah. So. We've been in this space for 20 years, uh, not to say that we're experts, but we've been producing events for a really, really long time. And what we've done is we've broken our events down by session. So it really depends. And I did, I would tell your um, audience, viewers, who's ever listening, go to upcomingevents.com to find all these amazing different sampling events out there. But generally speaking, we, we break our events down in sessions. And depending on the venue, depending on the space, like we have, and we'll talk about this one event that's coming up at the end of September. Um, we typically like to have them at like three to four hours and we like to break them down by sessions. And to me, I like sessions because people are busy and yeah. your audience and your viewers out there, people might have families and they have obligations on the weekends or some people really have really no obligations. And they're just like, they're out and they're just, they can really do whatever it is that they want to do. So trying to create different sessions um, helps people that are kind of planning their busy schedules. And then for me, more importantly, I hate waiting in line. <laughs> I'm an impatient person, like probably everyone else just hate waiting in line. So if you do session events, if you break these down um, per session, now, instead of doing this event that has 10,000 people there and these lines are outrageous, and it really hurts the customer experience. Well, now if you take that 10,000 people and you break that down to two or three sessions, that customer experience really goes through the roof. So to answer your question, most of our events, they really range anywhere from like three to four hours. And to me, I feel like that's ample amount of time to get into the event, get really intimate, walk around, try all these amazing things, and then get out. Yeah. <laughs> Now, out of curiosity, because I've been to uh, wine and food festivals prior, you know, before yeah. and it before the pandemic and actually after. But um, like a lot of them have headliners where there's cooking demos or or whatnot. Do you have anybody who headlines um, any of your shows? So so typically what we do is we, we so our and a lot of people do this. They'll bring in like a celebrity chef and stuff like that. So for us. We try to make all the different breweries, all the different food trucks, all the different restaurants. We try to make them the, really the stars of the show. So for us, let's not. And again, it's this is just our model. You know, there's there's a lot of different models out there which people do. So for us, let's not bring attention to one person or one area. And and that works for some people. For us, let's spread out the attention to all of our dis different participants. So if it's a taco festival, we'll have all these amazing food trucks. We'll have all these different amazing taco restaurants there. So everyone's kind of getting their equal kind of presence and getting like kind of an equal amount of love. So no, we don't do that, but we really just make sure that each chef or each restaurant or food truck that is participating, they actually become the star of the show. Which is key because honestly, like what you want to do is you want to promote the local, you know, available breweries, distilleries, uh, you know, the wine, I, 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 I fermenters, 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, eh, we'll call them fermenters, but the wineries, um, <laughs> like you want to be able to promote them and, and lift them up. But in the meantime, you're offering a great experience for everybody all around. Yeah, you're exactly. And trust me, if, if Gordon Ramsay calls and he wants to come out and be and, and host our event, I'm like, I'll take that call. But you're exactly right. For me, it's all about the restaurants. It's all about helping the community. It's all about having customers and the community come out and get intimate with these restaurants, get intimate with these food trucks, get intimate with these craft breweries that they might have never heard of before. Like to me, like that's where I have a real passion of just, you might not have ever heard of these chefs. And these chefs are these, they're just absolutely amazing. So for me, I like them to be the real true stars of the show. Yeah. No, I you you're saying, you know, for communities to come out together. I want to say and you know, like kind of use that as a, a a leaping board for the fact that you also um host charitable um events as well. Yeah, so for me, I always like to say there is nothing better than having a good time while doing good. Yeah. And if you notice for I don't, I don't want to say all of our events, but probably 90% of our events there's a charity component to that event. And it could be a very localized um, charity. And then it could be like a brand like the American Red Cross, right? Something yeah. that everyone knows. Um, so yes, if you look at our events, you will notice that we typically like to do a silent auction. Like to me, it's like, come on out. There's food, there's wine, there's entertainment, there's a DJ, there's a silent auction. There's like all these fun things to do while you're at the event. And then, oh, by the way, if you do bid on this item, if you do win concert tickets to go to this Taylor Swift show, you know that a portion of your proceeds are actually going back to this amazing charity that's doing these incredible things within the community. So the charity organizations that we work with, I love doing that. Um, I love doing good. I love helping the community. And to me, it just makes your event that much stronger. Yeah. Now we have uh, a little under, we have about like eight minutes left uh, with you. So I want to touch base on some of the events specifically that are coming up. Okay. Yeah. So the, a big one that we have coming up and this, to me, anyone that lives in the tri-state area, this is an event that people should definitely come and take a look at. And this, we have this event, it's called the All-Star Craft Beer Wine and Cocktail Festival. And the All-Star is a play off of the Major League Baseball All-Star game. And the idea was, how can we bring in all these All-Star brands uh, under one roof? So we take over Citizens Bank Park, which is home of the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. And we basically take over the whole ballpark. Oh, Main wow. Of course, there you can actually walk onto the baseball field, meaning the warning track. You can take a selfie in the dugout, the Hall of Fame club outside the ballpark. I mean, it is an amazing event. And like I said, it's a two session event. You pay your ticket and then you can actually come in. You don't have to pay any more out of pocket and you can sample all these amazing brands. And we typically have about 200 brands there in oh, addition wow. to all these amazing food options as well. Which is key. I mean, is, if you're going to be going there and and shopping and well, because I'm assuming that there's going to be some shopping available too, um, <laughs> shopping and tasting uh, different wines and 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 beers and whatnot, you're going to want to consume food. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I mean, for us doing these events, we want to make sure everyone comes out, everyone's having a good time, being socially responsible. And part of that is food, right? So just making sure that you're you're there, you're you're sampling a bunch of different items, and then obviously there's there's whether it's a pizza or a sandwich or food or donuts, what have you, to kind of soak up some of that alcohol. So yeah, there's some, always some um, amazing food options at our events, whether it's a food truck or whether we have our, our concession stands open. So that's a fun event. That's on Saturday, September 30th, and again, that's at Citizens Bank Park, which is home of the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. And I want to plug the fact that you guys are not just like hosting events in Philadelphia. You also host events in other states. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, literally it's we're on a national, you know, COVID derailed a lot of things, right? We couldn't bring people together, no fun, no large social gatherings. But now over the past year, yes, we have definitely opened things up and we are producing these events on a national level. So again, wherever you're um, checking in today, check the website, go to upcomingevents.com all throughout Jersey. We just wrapped up an amazing summer down at a bunch of the Jersey shore points. Um, but if you're in Delaware or if you're in New York or Connecticut or in PA, um, there's definitely something for you and for everyone. 
Yeah. And I and and I have to say, like, I've been, as I said, I've been to events where they're food and wine and, and you know, it's so much fun. I mean, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot because it's there's so much to take in. But again, you're you're given that that opportunity, that, you know, session to walk around, to experience everything and, you know, to taste like and let your nose guide you too. like you're going to smell you know, the tacos, the birria tacos or, you know, whatever the, the food vendor, because you mentioned tacos, <laughs> <laughs> You're, whatever the food event is, um, including I think you have wing fests in various states um, coming up soon, too. Yeah, I mean, it's football season. So what goes better with like football? And there's a, there's so many creative ways of making wings and incorporating things into your into your wing recipe. And it's like funny things that are like literally inside your kitchen right now. Like who would think that to incorporate any sort of like coffee grounds into your into your wings? And like these are the things that you get exposed to. These are the things you get insight in. Not only are you trying all these delicious wings or tacos or pizza or whatever the case may be, you're also getting some like tips and tricks on how you can create your own wing recipe. So when you're entertaining guests at your house, you go to these wing festivals and you get all this amazing like inspiration. Like, okay, this is something I'm going to add to my wing recipe to take it to the next level. Yeah. And I, 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 I'm a little bit like sore that you had said coffee grounds. Cause that's one of my secret ingredients. <laughs> and my, Cause I'm, I, I will take my mortar and pestle and I'll like grind down like coffee grinds and, um, and, I'm not going to say other ingredients, but I make some really amazing dry rubs. <laughs> yeah. So, so these events are exactly like that. Like you have some secrets, you have some tips and tricks. And to me, it's like, how can you bring everyone out, show everyone a fantastic time? How do you create a ton of value? I'm a consumer too, just like you, yeah. just like everyone listening in. It's like, man, it's like, it's, it's tough out there. So if I'm going to spend a dollar, I want to make sure that I'm getting a ton of value with that dollar. And I feel like when you come to our events, you pay your cover, you can come in, you can try all this stuff. It's all part of your ticket. There's entertainment. You're meeting all these amazing people. You're getting all this valuable insight. You feel like you walk away like, wow, there was some value there. That that was an amazing thing. I can't wait to go back to another one of those events. And whether it's a donut, taco, pizza, or you name it, um, for us, if we can create a lot of value and then pass along some uh, some tips and tricks, like to me, that's just an amazing day. It is. Now, for for our listeners out there, I would love for you to plug, you know, how to find you. But like, do you still take vendors or, you know, can vendors reach out to you or I should say businesses, local businesses still reach out and try to get in there um, and what that process might be? Yes. Yeah. Anyone that's listening today uh, from a consumer's perspective, if you want to buy a ticket, absolutely go to upcomingevents.com. Again, that's upcoming events with an s.com go to upcoming events.com and you'll see all the different events there it's a pretty robust website a very intuitive website but if you are a business owner and again there's probably a lot of people out there listening that maybe they have a food truck maybe they yeah. have a restaurant maybe they're a brewery maybe they're the local insurance company like we want you to like you should come out tell everyone about you know your local state farm agency so for us Anyone that's a local business owner that wants to come out, I think we do a fantastic job of really integrating your brand into the fabric of the community. So restaurants make sense. Obviously, food trucks make sense. But then if you're a small to medium-sized business owner that you just want to come out and engage with 10,000 people within your community, come on, you're invited to the party. Exactly. <laughs> and Or, you know, hey, maybe you can have a radio show on. Yes, yes, yes. Well, <laughs> clearly, if you want to market your brand, you got to be on the radio. You have to be right here promoting your uh, products and services. So, uh, yeah, anyone, though, that wants to be involved, we would love to have them out um, and really to expose their brand to maybe a new customer, a new audience that maybe they've never engaged before. Yeah. And uh, for our listeners, too, because it is tailgate season, aside from your Philly, uh, Philadelphia Phillies tailgate, What's another tailgate uh, event that's coming up that you can uh, plug? Because football season. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that we do. There's a couple travel um, groups that do stuff right around with the Giants. Obviously, the Giants are a big thing. I don't think we're doing anything with the Jets, but I know if you go onto the website, there's some New York Giants tailgates um, down at the uh, at the stadium there. 
um, at MetLife. And I'm trying to think if there's anything with baseball. No, the baseball stuff's gone and running now. Winding down. I would say right now, just New York Giants uh, tailgating football stuff. Okay. So New York Giants, if you're a New York listener, go out to one of the upcoming events. Actually, go to the upcoming events website. Get your ticket for your ultimate tailgate party. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Food Farms and Chefs. Ray, you were absolutely wonderful to speak to. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This was a, this was an absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to see you and all your listeners out to the events. If you see me, stop me. I would love the opportunity to roll out the red carpet to every single one of you. Come on out. You guys would have a blast. You go to upcomingevents.com for all that information. All right. Thank you so much. And tune in every single week as a new episode drops for Food Farms and Chefs.